times. Remember, this is going to get fucking nerdy. And I'm going to try not to say fuck so much because I was, you know, I was watching back the last broadcast and every other word is fuck, 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 fuck. But it's like when you're trying to like fill up time, like fill up pockets of like dead time, you just end up like, boom, boom, you know, you're like, you're like uh, just trying to distract, distract yourself so you, or distract, you know, or, or, or keep the, the um, dialogue going. So you just, what's the first thing that comes to my head is fuck. So I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's open this up. Oh, no, no, no. We don't want that. There we go. There we go. That's good. All right. I think we're ready to begin here. Let me pull up my, my notes. Uh, we got some notes. Oh, and of course, I didn't put on the phone. God damn it. This is stupid me. Whatever, man. Whatever. We're, we're live. That's it. We're just doing this. We're doing this thing. Okay? It's happening. Um, let's go to the notes. My notes here in front of me. Patter of feet upstairs. All right. Here it is. So, um, I thought it would be cool. First, uh, a, a, a housekeeping item. Uh, as I said, I, I re-listened to the broadcast last week. Just like, you know, kind of like just seeing how it like went and like digesting how it sounded. And was it, you know, what, what, what could I do better this time as opposed to the next time? And um, I did notice uh, that when I was talking about Mark Kennedy, uh, the founder of, of Misfits Central and, and the writer of the Misfits book, I said he was the only person to interview Glenn Danzig. That is obviously not true. Glenn has been interviewed a million billion times. But what I really meant to say, I was caught up in the moment and I couldn't verbalize to myself properly, uh, was uh, Mark's interview with Glenn besides the puss head interview is probably the most in-depth interview and no one's ever heard that interview everybody's heard the puss head interview but um it's probably the most detailed and in-depth interview that glenn has uh given not to like a professional magazine publication sort of situation like just sort of like a, a one-on-one -on -one, uh sort of thing so i just wanted to like clear that up uh yeah uh show and tell I thought it would be really fun to uh, show you guys something really cool that, um, you know, years and years ago, um, doing interviews, uh, meeting people, discovering things, I would uh, come across, you know, just artifacts, some, you know, that I would always like, you know, be like holding this thing in my hand that's like some like artifact from this band. I'd be like, whoa, this is so fucking cool. You know, it's like, uh, like, you know, do, like Doyle's choker with the little skull on it that you've seen in those photos, uh, stuff like that, um, held every, you know, all the records, all the seven inches, having all the seven inches stacked up in my hand like this, you know, I'm, some of you are collectors. So some of you know, uh, what that's like already, but it's like really cool to hold, you know, probably like $10,000 worth of records in your hand stacked up. I think fair market price would probably be 10,000 if you add them all up together. I don't know. I don't know the market that well anymore. Um, let's see what we have here. Uh, so along the way in my travels, what are these? Oh, I didn't realize I had this. Look at this, actually. <gasps> the last video business media shirts. And as you can see, my previous former production, whatever you want to call it, is templated after horror business, uh, video business media. I was not expecting that, actually. Okay. <laughs> no, this is what I meant. Okay. Here it is. Here it is. Burying the lead in my treasure chest. Uh, so a long time ago, I interviewed this guy who I'm going to leave nameless as well for a few different reasons, especially because of what uh, what is in this bag. And um, so I'm interviewing this guy that knew the band really, really, really well during the 1979 period. Um, he was uh, good friends with uh, Dave Street and Natasha Dunzio and... Uh, all, all these, all these people, um, he was on the scene. He was on the, uh, music scene in New York in 1979. Uh, well, just for the late seventies in general, uh, was a teamster, was in the union, um, uh, like film, one of the film unions, electrical. He was in the electrical union, I think. Nice, super duper nice guy, sweetheart. Um, 
a really unique. Remember I was telling you last week how there's like so many people that have these really unique perspectives on the band. It's not going to be the same old thing that you hear from Glenn, Jerry, or Doyle. It's like some unique perspective as how they saw the band at the time. And there's like an honesty to that, that it's not honest for the sake of like, oh, Glenn, Jerry, and Doyle are being dishonest. It's like an honesty or or a, recolle a recollection that, that has no bias. Like there's no, um, there's no like ulterior, like, oh, I want to present myself this certain way, so I'm not going to mention this. These guys are just like, they, they don't have anything, you know, they don't have a, 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 a horse in the race. Uh, and this is one of those guys. And um, so along the time that Glenn and Jerry are making music, they're also like doing other things. And I don't know when it started, but it was definitely going on in 78 and 79 for the rest of the band's career. I'd say probably started in, in 78, 79, maybe late 78. I don't really know. I, I don't honestly know. I would have to ask somebody in, in the inner circle. Uh, Jeff, come to South Florida and interview Joey Image. John, I already did that. John Zenos. I did interview Joey Image for two hours, and he's in this documentary. Um, but we're going to talk about somebody else who's in Florida, who will also remain nameless, who I interviewed on that trip. What's up, Frank? How are you? Uh, thank you so much for uh, connecting with me. Uh, we have to talk, buddy, but not right now, because I'm in the middle of something. I don't want to forget the story. Okay. So, so, so Glenn and Jerry and maybe like, I don't know, Doyle by proxy as like a little brother, Rody or whatever, people by proxy, um, not Erie Vaughn yet because he wouldn't come to know the band until a little bit later. I don't think Erie Vaughn, but Erie Vaughn would get heavily into this too. Um, the Misfits were, or Glenn and Jerry were... Are, are artists, man. They're not just they're not just musicians. They're artists. We know that Glenn's a photographer. We know that um, uh, uh, Jerry worked for his dad in uh, Jerry and Doyle worked for their dad in Pro Edge. Uh, they 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 know how to make stuff. They make stuff with their hands. They they have a lot of ingenuity. And one of the things they totally. What's up, Eric? Eric is a guy from uh, the Misfit Central forum. I forget what his handle was, but I know he's from Misfit Central for sure. Um, sorry. Uh, so what they used to do uh, is they, they would just make shit. They made a lot of shit, a lot of really cool shit. Um, I guess maybe in Glenn's basement and at Jerry Jerry's house and stuff. Uh, and one of the things that they, they got heavily into was screen printing. Uh, you, we know this because of all the, all the posters that they would, you know, they would silk screen posters and print posters in these very primitive analog sort of ways. Today you can Photoshop something and you send it to the, uh, you know, the printer and, and they print it up or you send it to a guy like, I'm going to plug Sharpie Riot right now. This guy, Josh Grove, uh, Sharpie Riot, he makes stickers. He did those video business media shirts. He is an independent sticker and t-shirt guy and uh, he makes high quality stuff and I highly recommend him for your business. He does pins too. Great guy. Um, you know, you send it to one of those guys and they print up the shirts and they send it back to you in, in a box. But back then DIY in the late seventies, you know, you wanted to make your own shit. You had to make your own shit. And so the process, as I recall, the process goes like this. If you want to silk screen something, whether it's a poster or a t-shirt, what you're going to do, right? Yeah. Axel, Axel is Sid. Yeah. I remember that, man. I remember that. Uh, so what you're going to do is if you're, if you're silk screening something back then is, you know, you're not going to scan it into your scanner because scanners didn't exist back then. So what would you do? Remember the overhead projectors in school, like back in the eighties and seventies, eighties and nineties, I guess. So what you do is you take your image, whatever it is, you, you, you rip something out of a magazine, right? You tear out uh, an ad or, or, or a comic book page or whatever. You put it on the overhead, you put it on the bed. Some of you will know what I'm talking about. It would be great. I don't know if you can post photos in the comments, but it'd be great if someone could find that and post a photo of it. So that way I'm not, I don't stop talking. So what you do is you, you put it on the overhead and then the light shoots up through the, the thing and then it projects onto a wall. And then what you do is you have this image, right? You have this image against the wall that's been projected and you take your pen or pencil or whatever, and you start to trace it and you trace it uh, like this, as so, you trace whatever the image is onto uh, your, your your paper, however big you want it. And how do you decide how much to blow it up on? Well, with a computer, you just go, oh, I want it at 100% or 90% or 80%. But back then, all you got to do is just, you know, much like if you're, if you're, if you're 
uh, projecting light against the wall, all you do is just move it closer, move it farther away. If you want the image to be smaller, move it closer. If you want the image to be bigger, you move it far away. And that blows up the image or shrinks the image. The more you blow up an image, um, the, 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 the weirder and more blurry it's going to look like. The closer you get, um, depending on the resolution and the detail. And so... What Glenn, I don't know if Jerry did, I guess Jerry did it too, maybe, uh, and I know that Erie Vaughn would do a ton of this. Uh, what they would do is they would blow shit up and they would trace it and they would, um, there's a process, you put uh, some chemical, I forget what it is, you put a chemical on uh, the screen that you're tracing onto or something, I'm missing a step here, you could probably Google, uh, Google this on YouTube, you, uh, you, you put uh, something on the screen, you put a... Um, uh, a chemical and then you scrape it away and it leaves like a, an image it leaves like a negative image of whatever it is that you were silk screening and that becomes the screen and then what you do is you take your paint whatever paint you have and the boys the guys uh uh, uh film an acetone thank you eric i believe yeah acetone i think is what you use to you pour it on the pour on the acetone um, and, and what the guys used to do is they and this i know from this dude who i who i interviewed they go down to chinatown and they pick up these shitty white t-shirts, you know, like really, really poor quality because obviously they want really low overhead. The acetone sort of melts the film into the mesh of the screen. Thank you, Eric. There's our scientific explanation that I was not able to provide. Uh, shout out to Eric Carroll in the comments. So they would do that. They'd get their silk screens. They'd go down to Chinatown. They would uh, pick up tons and tons of these cheap, shitty t-shirts and they would make their own t-shirts. And th at first it was just a hobby, like, or maybe, I don't know, maybe it was a hobby, but you know, that's not true. You know, okay, okay, I'm about to like retroactively contradict myself because again, if you look at that picture that uh, Tanner had from last week, you'll see uh, Glenn wearing the no fun shirt, right? Glenn made that shirt. So they were making stuff as early as 77. So Glenn was like kind of making, but then they really got into a more of a manufacturing process with uh, the bootleg shirts from Chinatown and these, print, uh, these prints. And what they were doing, you know, it's funny. We talk about how like, you know, the Misfits retroactively are like so ahead of their time and like, you know, they're doing all these things outside of their time in the sense that like, if they, they were ahead of the curve, they were doing things that everybody would do 20 years later. You know what I'm saying? Like, like what they were essentially doing was they were doing their own hot topic in, in the basement. What does that mean? It means that like every fucking like counterculture shirt you can get at hot topic, all like the cool things that like, you know, you see, it's like, Oh, I love that cereal. I love count chocula. Well, you know what? I want a t-shirt of count chocula. And back in the day, unless you ordered it directly, maybe from the, 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 uh, cereal company itself, you're not going to get a count chocula t-shirt. So what do you do? You make it. And that was like a very DIY punk sort of thing to do. And that's what, you know, uh, those guys were doing. And so they're, they're printing their, their own t-shirts and not only are they printing them, they're printing the, they start printing band t-shirts. Um, but they're printing just things that they really like lots of different characters. And, um, and then what they're doing is they're bringing them to the city and selling them in t-shirt shops. There are a lot of now, uh, you had all the punk stuff going on, which I want to talk about uh, a little bit later. You have all the punk stuff going on, because I want to set the scene for you of where where this all happened. You have all the punk stuff going on musically, but then there's also, like, the fashion side of things. And you go on St. Mark's, and you have, like, you know, uh, Tish and Snooki of The Sick Fucks, a great band that you should check out if you have never heard of them. Check them out. They were produced by Andy Chernoff, and they were uh, a fixture on the CBGB scene, but they were more of a joke band, stuff like that. They had a, sh a store called Manic Panic, and you may be familiar with their hair color line, which comes from that store, Manic Panic. And those dudes are millionaires. Uh, at least Tish and Snooki are, and that's where all the hair color... I believe that's where Doyle... Uh, how Doyle dyed his hair pink back in the day when he got in a lot of trouble for dyeing his hair pink in eighth grade and it was in the paper and shit. Um, so they would take these shirts. Glenn and Jerry, in 1979 specifically, I know this, would take these T-shirts to stores like Natasha's. Uh, and everybody's seen that picture of... of uh, I believe it's Natasha, Jerry only, uh, the person I interviewed, and uh, Joey Ramone. Because Natasha used to make clothes for the Misfits as well as Joey Ramone. And uh, he's in a, a, a leopard He's in a leopard print suit, this guy who I interviewed. He's in that picture. Everybody's seen that picture. It's an iconic picture. And it shows how far back uh, Jerry and Joey Ramone go. Um, because nobody really knows or nobody really, you never really hear about the Ramones and the Misfits back in the day. In the 90s, you you know, they were, they, they were chumming it up quite a bit. I mean, Jerry plays bass on Joey Ramone's solo album. And uh, uh, a drummer who I'd rather not name plays the drums. 
Um, so they would bring these shirts to various different shops. I know for a fact Natasha's. I don't know where else. And what they would do is they would they would uh, sell stuff on consignment, and that's how they would you know partially fund the band at least you know, uh, or that's how they would they would they would generate revenue. That's how Glenn would ge generate revenue. And there are tons of these shirts, and you know there's a certain way. Well, let me just reveal them now. Okay, enough of an introduction. So here, well. So I'm interviewing this guy and he goes, hey, want to see something really cool? And I'm like, yeah, of course, I always want to see something really cool. And he goes down to his basement and he comes back up with a duffel bag full of old, dusty, crumpled up T-shirts. Um, a lot like I know you guys have seen Steve Zing has shown on his Facebook Live. Like he's got all these old T-shirts. It was kind of like that, you know just crumpled up, like, just oodles of shirts. There must have been 30, 40 shirts in there, right? And he's just showing me all these different designs. And there's Quisp cereal. There's, like, all these different things that Glenn and Jerry had printed up. I was looking for the Count Chocula one in particular to see if there was an extra one of those. Giganter. A lot of... Glenn was into... Jap as we all know, Glenn is into Japanese cartoons, right? So they would print up a lot of Japanese. And, you know, I'm sure it was very expensive to order Japanese uh, T-shirts from Japan, you know, uh, for your favorite character. So why not just make it yourself? And that's what... That's what... Uh, uh, Glenn would do. And later, you know, people would, would follow suit. And, you know, the ones that weren't profiting uh, would make really cool misfit shirts, much to Glenn's jargon. Uh, although he does talk about in that interview how he's like kind of cool with it. I don't know. Um, so, so I'm looking through all, I'm seeing all these different shirts and it's just fucking amazing. And my, the guy who I interviewed is just like, uh, do you want some? And I was like, do I want some? Do I want some? Do I want some of those shirts? Because each one of those shirts, all right, I don't know what the market value of these shirts are, but they must, you probably, even dirty, even as disgusting as these shirts were, they probably fetched some coin on eBay. You probably could make a nice, a nice, some nice chump change from something that, you know, uh, materials wise was probably like, you know what, like a dollar, you know what I mean? Uh, in paint and, and, and cotton t-shirt. Uh, probably goes for at, at least a hundred dollars, maybe two hundred dollars, depending on the condition. Maybe upwards of three hundred dollars, depending on the rarity. I don't know. I once thought they were worth more. Who knows? Um, so he lays out all the shirts and he's like, "What do you want?" And I just, I, I'm like, ah! I'm like a kid in the candy store. And of course, I go for the things that I recognize. So uh, I've shared pictures of these uh, on the Facebook page before, but I've never uh, really explained the story behind them. Uh, and so, uh, and, and and here's the thing that you need to remember about this. So this is, well, first, this is Vampire Us. This is a vampire shirt. Some people have seen this. Sleeveless. Smells terrible. Um, the label is almost washed out. So look at the label here. Look at this. Look at these labels. I don't know if you can see it. That's something you never see when you see these photos. Can you see that? Well, well, there's a delay here, so let's see. I don't know if that's going to show. It might be out of focus, but I'll read the label to you. It says, 100% cotton. Oh, this one was from Sears. Okay, so that was a Sears shirt. I know that they used to use bootleg Chinatown shirts. This label is a medium. I don't know where it's from. The shirts are, are, are not very high quality, but what's cool about this is, A... It is, uh, this one is not hand colored. I've seen ones where they're, uh, I've seen Vampiro ones, vamp Vampirella ones that are just black and white with no color. This is the only one I've seen that has color like this. And so they, he tried to do like this red. And every time you change a color when you're, when you're silk screening this way, you have to use a different screen. You can't use the same screen, although maybe what they did, this looks like it was a fade, so maybe they used the same screen. He put red and then he put yellow and then he tried to fade it to create a little bit of orange. Colors have faded over uh, the years. But as you can see, you know, quite clearly, this was something probably out of a comic book that Glenn had. And he projected it and traced it. Notice, look at all the line work, man. I mean, this was all done by hand. That's what's so insane about this. Besides being actually uh, printed by hand, you know, he had, this was traced by hand. And the, the, the lines are really thick. Who knows if the drawing had such thick lines? I might have had to compensate a bit, right? So this is this is a Glenn Danzig original shirt, man. Like Glenn printed this himself. You know, that's pretty freaking cool. So there's that one. I thought that was the coolest of the non misfits related shirts that uh, I saw. There were only two, and I took them. They were given to me. I I, I took the two shirts. 
this is pretty okay this is pretty fucking special this i i don't know if this is true or not i tell people this is true i don't know who could have else who else might have colored it maybe it wasn't but i like to think this is a hand colored Glenn Danzig Night of Living Dead t-shirt right here. So here's Night of Living Dead, and this is this looks like it was orange marker. So he printed it, and once again, look at the image. Look how, you know, there's a lot of detail in that image that is sort of like it's really everything's really thick because you couldn't have such thin lines when you're doing such, you know, you know, uh, uh, fine you can't have such fine line work when you're when you're printing in this sort of way, or it's harder to. And so it's like you're trying to keep as much detail as you can, but you're keeping all the lines really thick. And, uh, yeah, it's just, this is a hand, hand colored shirt. Uh, it's pretty special. Uh, I need to get it framed, uh, in some sort of light box or something. Uh, and lastly, this one, uh, I, I'm told is actually exceedingly rare. This is a, a, a beware shirt. This is a beware shirt. So these are 1979 era shirts, uh, Night of the Living Dead and Beware. I don't think they would be printing a Beware or the Night of the Living Dead uh, in 82. Maybe they did. Maybe it was on the Fiend, the Fiend Club f uh, form. But you would have to imagine that... You'd have to imagine that they were probably extra stock that Glenn had. Or maybe he would kept running them off because he already had the... the um, he already had the, the silk screen made. You know, those silk screens are good for a certain period of time. Then they eventually they, they get shot and you got to make a new one. So maybe he was running them off. Who knows? But I do know that the t-shirt money definitely sustained Glenn, sustained the banner, sustained Glenn uh, for for quite uh, a time, quite a while. Uh, I thought that was just something really cool. And it's just, you know, like I said, it's it's one facet of something we could talk about this more another day of like how this band like just made shit. They made really cool shit. And that really cool shit survived the band long after they were gone. People were collecting these these treasure these treasures um, they put so much value into them because uh, they're just these handmade artifacts from a, a time that, that was no more. Uh, made in exceedingly small quantities. It's very interesting. Uh, so there's that. <clears throat> Need a sip of coffee. So. Um, and, and Glennon and Doyle would... Sorry, Glenn and Jerry would, would, on their end of this, would start making their own guitars. And there's a lot to say about those guitars. You know, they started off, um, I, I, you know, Doyle started off with an Iceman. He had Iceman and, and uh, Jerry had his Rickenbacker. He's, as a matter of fact, Rickenbacker became his main jam. But what they started to do after a while, according to my source, one of my sources, what they would do is uh, they started to buy knockoffs. They would buy Rickenbacker knockoffs. They would buy Iceman knockoffs. So they weren't exactly Iceman or Rickenbacker originals because they were so expensive. But they would buy knockoffs. They would they would cut them up with rotary saws and all sorts of things. They'd redecorate them. And then they would smash them to shit. And as we all know, like, you know, Jerry was very generous. He's a very generous person in general. But Jerry would, like, smash these things, throw them into the crowd, whatever. Um, give one to Harley Flanagan. He gave Harley Flanagan the base that was used on Walk Among Us. Just because he's like such a generous guy, but it's like probably because at the time Jerry in Jerry's mind is like I got like a hundred of these things, whatever. What they do is they buy the knockoffs, but then they would buy different pickups, different strings, different uh, components. I'm not a musician, and they would solder them into the knockoff guitars so that the the quality of the actual intricacies were, was better than the the body of what they were and eventually that evolved into making their own guitars in pro edge which was the next era of whatever uh the the, the guitar that that D doyle always talks about uh drawing on his uh the, the 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 cardboard paper on his textbooks that his mother would wrap his textbook in cardboard paper um and they would make you know spikes for the drum the drum heads as we know they would just do all this really cool shit uh, and then before we go on further, I just want to talk about the, the quickly, someone touched last week. I think it was Ian, actually, Ian, Ian Potash, Ian Potash. It was Ian Potash. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, who might have talked about last week about how, like, uh, I don't remember what he was talking about, but I started talking about, or, or somebody, I was talking to someone about how punk, uh, sort of splits, uh, splits off, right? Um, it starts off as punk rock and that encompasses a lot of different types of punk rock punk rock was anything or punk music whatever was anything from television 
you know, which doesn't sound very punk in, in the punk sort of way, all the way up to the Dead Boys or the Ramones, right? It was like all these different offshoots. And then they sort of like diverge into these three different branches. The record, uh, the Sex Pistols uh, explode in 1977 and the year of punk becomes 77. And uh, punk literally becomes national news. It's in everybody's, uh, uh, and it had been long gestating before that, but this tiny counterculture explodes in the same way that the counterculture of 1967, Hyde Ashbury explodes, right? The hippie culture exploded in, in the late 60s. Now, 10 years later, punk culture is exploding. And the Sex Pistols are this huge deal. And there's this, they're, they're kind of like an NSYNC in a way. They're like this, they're, they're a, they are a, const a manufactured punk band uh, created by this manager to be uh, super um, obnoxious and salacious. And uh, as a result, their label drops them and punk becomes a bad word. It's not a palatable word. It's not a marketable word anymore. Punk is not commercial. Um, and record companies tried to make it commercial with the Sex Pistols. It doesn't work, right? So then the record, and anybody who's read any book on like punk rock will like knows about this shit. It's very common knowledge. But what would happen? What happened is, so you have the punk scene that that's happening in the uh, on, in New York City in the in the seventies. Uh, you have you have it sprouting up in England, and you have it uh, out in L.A. And what happens is some of the punk bands that have a softer sound have a sound that's more keyboard based have a sound that is uh, more palatable to record executives' ears, um, get sort of plucked out of the rest of the crop and become a new term invented by record labels. Nobody invented this term. Punk was coined, you know, uh, organically. This was invented by a record label, and the term is new wave. So when you hear that word new wave, new wave is invented by a record label to try and sell punk to the masses. And it's always like the softer sort of stuff. But you look at like a lot of those new wave bands have punk roots. A great example is the Go-Go's. The Go-Go's started off as kind of like a, a, a pretty obnoxious punk band. Um, Blondie is another great example where Blondie has gr punk roots. They get uh, signed to a record label and they become kind of like the face of new wave. And you look at like you know, a heart of glass or, you know, uh, what's that song? Dreamin'? Oh, Dreamin'. Dreamin's a great song. You know, they just go away. They become, uh, they become like the front and center of new wave. Um, in 1980, that is when I think kind of like the main year when this split is sort of happening. Someone will probably tell me that's not true. But the reason why I say 1980 is because around this time in 1980, um, there is another sort of movement that's forming within punk. It's very interesting. It is, um, it's the fa it's the beginnings of hardcore, and the reason why I bring all this up, it's like Jeff, why are you not talking about the Misfits? What, we want, that's what this is all about. Why are you not talking about the Lost song? I will. I'll get to that. Believe me, what, the last one went on quite a while, so stay with me, guys. We're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. Um, uh, the Misfits, as I said last, much like the Dead Kennedys, much like Black Flag, they were around from the late 70s through the early 80s. But not only that, they sort of jumped from all these different... They, they sort of survived through every sort of, like, phase of of punk in its heyday, you know? Um, they... It started off as... Hold on, what the fuck? Okay, it's still going. It started off as... Um, they start off in 77 with uh, and, and played alongside a lot of, you know, uh, punk bands. You know, their, some of their contemporaries were just, you know, of that punk rock genre. Uh, and then in around 1980, uh, Max's during Max's can during the Max's Kansas City time, uh, th these these new bands started to, to come up. And they and you have bands like the Bad Brains, you have bands like the Stimulators and you have bands like the Mad playing alongside the Misfits all at Max's Kansas City, and they turn, it sort of turns into this new thing called hardcore, and that's why you, you know, people talk about Harley Flanagan and, and Crow Mags, and before that he was in this drumming for a band called The Stimulus, which is how he met the Misfits. And so these bands were kind of playing together, and so what happens is you have this, this tree that's sort of splitting off, right? You have punk, because look at the Ramones. The Ramones are not hardcore punk, and the Ramones are not new wave. The Ramones always sort of stayed punk, 
they were signed to Sire, and they sort of always were punk. And there were a couple of bands that were like kind of like that. I think the Dickies were kind of like that too, you know, on the on the on the on the left coast, the west coast. Um, so new wave, the new wave punk goes mainstream and becomes accepted by you know radio stations like you know main radio stations and gets played on MTV, and then um, the counterculture underground movement go- becomes hardcore. And then the bands that would pop up after the Mad, the Stimulators, the Misfits, and the Bad Brains, really the Bad Brains, I think, became like the, the center focus of that sound. They really, if you ask me, they invented fucking hardcore. They did, man. Like, they fucking, the Bad Brains are unlike anything. Anybody who's heard or seen or, or, or was around back then will tell you the Bad Brains were like unlike anything you ever saw. And they do are there are a couple connections with the Misfits, especially when the Misfits were going to England in 1979 to tour with the Damned. Uh, there was something God, I'm trying to remember. It was something about uh, Ern, Ernie Hudson's drum set was connected to Joey Image somehow. Or they were going to borrow Ernie Hudson's drum set. I have to review the tape, as I said last week. I need to rewatch all these tapes. Um. So you get the, and that's the, that's sort of where the path that the Misfits started to follow. They started to play, they started to get faster, they started to get harder. Doyle joins the band. They have this, this, this fucking tough as nails looking image. And they start, uh, they start hanging out with bands like Gangrene and they start going down to DC and they're playing with Black Flag and the Necros, Necros are like, they're, the Necros revered the Misfits. And um, they sort of like, and, and the Meat Men, and they, they just, they become a hardcore band. And that's how they finish out as a hardcore band. And Earth AD becomes the hardcore record, or one of them. And people say it's like the template for thrash punk, I think. I don't know where that all comes from. I just think, they're just fucking hardcore. That album is hardcore. Really hardcore. I mean, it just, you, you take the, the drummer of Black Flag, you sit the drummer of Black Flag behind the Misfits, and that's what you get, Earth AD. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, let's talk about that show. So now we're going to rewind. Let's see where I am on time here. How long have I been talking for? Just out of curiosity. Uh, whoa, okay. Pretty good. Okay, not bad. Um, so we're now flashing back to February of 2017, where when I listened to this show, I told you all about it last week. I'm not going to rehash that again, because, you know, if you if you were here last week, Great. If not, just go back and listen to the previous episode, um, the previous broadcast. I talk about it in painstaking detail. <laughs> Probably more painstaking than what people want. Um, so I'm, I'm sitting with Manny. We're listening to the show. Uh, we've just finished listening to West End Avenue, right? I'm going out of order here. This is song number four. West End Avenue was number three in the set, but I'm going for the more, the, the, I think, the shit that everybody wants to know about, the lost songs. Um... Uh, so here's from my notes, and as I did last week, I sort of expanded on them. I really s- just fucking sat uh, in, in a, uh, an echo chamber and just like meditated on this as long as I could, trying to remember that time and uh, the the the. And this one's easier than West End Avenue because I sing this all the time. That's right, I sing. Uh, ever since I heard this song, I sing it to myself all the time. I hum it. I listen to it. I think about it. I just, because it's just, a, it's like how I keep it alive. And so, and it's probably morphed a little bit. I probably have morphed it and made it like an ugly reflection of what it really was when I heard it the first time. But um, I even embarrassingly sort of like recorded myself into my phone going like, like trying to remember the fucking song and so I'm like playing that back now like trying to like hear it fresh um okay ready I'm gonna start reading from my notes and as I did last time I'm probably going to jump out of my notes and talk and stuff um and yada 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 Um, do we have any oh shit oh shit oh we do have yes sorry okay so I did not see these comments I just want to go back in the comments real quick Uh, emulse Anthony Borello says emulsifier that's the word I was thinking of Anthony uh, emulsifier. That's what it is, man. Um, Cindy, Cindy Logan. Excellent. This is what I'm talking about, Cindy. This friggin' thing. That's what they would use. An overhead thing. Great. Um, what else? You know, sometimes the, 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 the comments don't come up in real time. Ropa dope. Uh, Matt Jones. I don't know what that means, but, uh, please explain further down in the comments. Um, thanks Ian. I'm glad I'm good. Um, Eugenio. From Eugenio Gonzalez from from Mexico. What's up, man? Viva la Mexico. Hope you guys are doing okay down there. Please.
Please stay safe. I hope everybody's safe. Anyway, let's let's read this shit. Okay. This one also might be a little controversial, as I will explain. So let's go back to the year 2012. Um, I flew down to Florida as... So who mentioned, uh, did I interview um, Joey Image? Who said I should interview Joey Image? I forget. Oh, man, these comments are like out of... John. Oh, John, yes. So, John, back when I went to interview Joey Image, I interviewed someone else. I had to make that trip worth it. Joey Image was a big get, but I needed to get some other people, too. So I did. I interviewed uh, Dave Scott from Adrenaline OD. Hi, Dave. I hope you're well down in Florida. Stay safe. Um, and I also interviewed uh, this other guy who used to play in bands with Glenn before he was he formed the Misfits. He was around on the Lodi scene. Um, he is, uh, I believe he played in Kudat and Bujang. It's not Hudat and Bujang, as mis misheard when, when Mark Kennedy's listening to that or, or, or talking to Glenn. He misinterprets Glenn. Glenn says something like Kudat and Bujang, and he thinks he says Hudat and Bujang. Uh, so 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 uh, this guy was a part of that project. Um, not Mr. Jim. I believe Mr. Jim was also in Kudat and Bujang, but it's not Mr. Jim, uh, who I've also interviewed. Mr. Jim, I hope you're doing okay, buddy, out there. I don't know if you're listening to this, but if you ever do... Hope you're well. Um, Mr. Jim, the nicest human being on the planet. Like, honestly, the salt of the earth. Like, this guy is like a gem. Like, truly. I can't say enough nice things about him. Um, so, I interview this guy. Going on eight years now, I visited someone who used to play with Glenn in his previous band before the Misfits. This is my notes. I was particularly excited to speak to him for many reasons, but most of all, I thought maybe he would remember or know the origin of one of the three law songs from Misfit Central. Super recap from last week. If you go into the Misfit Central timeline, Mark Kennedy from that same interview, I'm assuming, mentions Feline Nursery, West End Avenue, and uh, motherfucking Harpies in the Night. These three songs that we've never heard. The, the, the golden holy grail for Misfits fans to hear. Um, he did not know Feline Nursery, but... Friends, again, if you're unfamiliar with last week's broadcast or if you're unfamiliar in general, if you listen to Spinal Remains, Spinal Remains is the evolution of Feline Nursery. Uh, Glenn turned spinal, uh, Feline Nursery into Spinal Remains. Um, which so He did not know Feline Nursery, which led me to believe that perhaps it was fairly new by the time they were playing it live in 1977. So going back to the 1770 show, perhaps Feline Nursery was actually a relatively new song, and that's why uh, this guy was not as familiar with it. It also makes me think that perhaps this old song, and perhaps maybe one of this song, Harpies in the Night, perhaps it was dropped from the Misfits material because it might have been a song from that previous band. Maybe Kudat and Bujang used to perform Harpies in the Night. I never asked him that. I wish I had. Should have asked him. What was I thinking? Um, it is also possible that he simply didn't remember the song re re regarding Har Feline Nursery. He also did not know West End Avenue. So maybe West End Avenue, Glenn pulls out the keyboard and he's writing the song West End Avenue, one of the early, you know, at that beginning when he's when he started the Misfits. It's possible that West End Avenue could be a song as early as 1976. Uh, but here is, here's the crazy part. He did uh, seem to recall Harpies in the Night. I went, I asked him, I was like, do you remember a song called Harpies in the Night? And he goes like this. He goes like this. Kind of like what I kind of felt last week. He just sort of like looks off. He thinks for a moment. And he goes, yeah. He goes, yeah. And then he says, but he seemed, I, this is what I wrote, but he seemed to recall Harpies in the Night and proceeded after a moment of pause to recall something from almost 40 years back. And then he sang this to me. <laughs> Ready for this? He sang, he goes like this. Sing like harpies in the night, in the night. That's all he did. No, nothing more. Just sing like harpies in the night, in the night. And I was just like, oh, what? I was like, wait a minute. And he's like, yeah. And he wasn't like, it wasn't like the 100%, but he just, he did that. He fucking did that. And much like, when when Jonathan Grimm, a.k.a. Jim the Tank Dorsey, a.k.a. Tank, sang West End Avenue after he heard Jerry do it in his 
1994 in Jerry's Kitchen when they were making pancakes. West End Avenue. West End Avenue. Um, here's this guy going, sing like harpies in the night, in the night. I was just like, it blew, it blew my mind. Hold on, let me refresh this. I don't know if more comments are coming in, but that's what happened last time. And I didn't see them because I was out of this thing. Let's see what happened. Same. I don't want to hear that shit. Um, okay, now we're good. So he's going, sing. And then, you know, I left that interview. And much like the West End Avenue thing, I'm telling everybody, hey, sing like harpies in the night, in the night. Sing like harpies in the night, in the night. And I'm just like imagining what this song could have been. What was it? Sing like harpies in the night, in the night. Um, I took that everywhere with me. It was a revelation and for years would be uh, what I thought the closest I would get to hearing the song until February of 2017, sitting with Manny, listening to his tape, dot, dot, dot. Um, but yeah, that was a really cool thing. And I, yeah, I would tell people for years, it was like this little trivia currency that I had because, you know, every Misfits nerd like myself was like, I know more about the band than you know more about the band. And this is real. <laughs> oh, yeah, what about this? Oh, yeah, what about this? Ian says, somehow bits of lyrics for the Lost Songs were on Misfit Central. Always added intrigue to the legend. I believe what uh, Ian is, is referring to is... When Mark Kennedy uh, record, uh, wrote that timeline, he he mentions with Feline Nursery, uh, he quoted the song beginning with, I'm going to throw away the key to my Feline Nursery. and But nobody knew where that fit into the song until now. Nobody knew where that fit in. They just knew it was, I'm going to throw away the key to my Feline Nursery. And I can tell you, it comes at the beginning of the song. Instead of, I might as well just spoil it. Instead of going... Uh, this is unreally sex, this is unreally love. Da, 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 da. It goes, I'm gonna throw away the key to the feline nursery. Da, 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 da. Um, good, good, Denise. Sing it forever. Let it spread, man. Although, don't sing it quite yet because there's more to that story coming, coming up, man. There's more to that story. Uh, but it's still fun to sing and it's still fun to think that, like, uh, you know, like, that that was the song sing because couldn't you imagine Glenn just going like sing like hobbies in... like just like really belting it out Elvis style but he wouldn't have belted it out Elvis style he would have belted it out Jim Morrison style as per what I've heard um so yeah I'm gonna throw away the key to the feline nursery and it's more like that it isn't like you know it's a lot more like it's a lot more uh dirty fast snotty on Static Age this is a really sex. This is a really life. This is a really thing I like. It's just more like, I'm going to throw away the key to the feline nursery. Get on the floor and whisper my name. Away. Like that. And, um, yeah, it's really fucking cool, right? So, okay. So now, now going on to the next part. This, this is the part that makes my brain hurt, uh, a lot. Um, so in, on Facebook, um, well, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself here, sorry, sorry, getting ahead of myself, um, so this is my thoughts on the day, that, I guess this was on my thought, this is one of the thoughts on, on the day when I wrote down my notes in a, in a fever, in a fevered urgency, right, um, my brain is still trying to process that I've actually just heard the lost song West End Avenue, I was very underprepared for the next bit of information that would come moments later as the tracks were changing. The next track on the CD begins. Glenn says something at the beginning. Uh, and this is what, okay, and then this has, this is one of those things that just like, I just rack over and over in my brain that I've been thinking about and thinking about and thinking about. And it's so nice to talk to someone about it, like talk and like talk about this with other people. I don't know, just like, 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 just say it. Like, this is just what I've been thinking about. Um, Glenn says something at the beginning, and it's something like, this is to go drive me, or this used to be drive me, or this is the girl drive me, or this is go drive me. Um, I can't, I can't feel, it was so gar, you know, the tape is very listenable, and there's some things you can hear very clearly, 
and there are other things that you just don't. Like on any classic, you know, come on, all of us, all of us have heard misheard Misfits lyrics over the years. Uh, just look at, you know, the, the Misfit, the lyrics on Misfit Central. Uh, uh, this is the genie of your death for Green Hell. Uh, just ridiculous. I think J uh, James Hetfield, there's like some YouTube clip of James Hetfield talking. Somebody post that in the, in the comments below for everybody. Uh, uh, James Hetfield is going like, uh, uh, was Glenn, like, is Glenn playing a dog in us with these lyrics? This here in, here in the eye is the genie of death or something. Uh, you know, it's just like totally mishearing these lyrics. And then when the lyrics book, the lyric books came out and we got to hear what, what he's friggin' really saying on Wolf Blood. Holy shit. Holy shit. What a dark song about turning into a werewolf. Holy fuck. Glenn loved to write about turning into werewolves. Um... You don't know who I'm talking to. No one ever did. Wow. Blows my mind. Okay. Um, so it's kind of hard to hear some things. So yeah, but he's saying like this, this is to go drive me. This is to go drive me. This used to be drive me. This is a girl drive me. However, um, it was only afterwards when I asked Manny, he said it was harpies in the night. Wow. Got to hear harpies in the night. Uh, now here's the thing though, I've been told elsewhere this is in fact not Harpies in the Night, but rather something else, and someone with good authority told me this. So I really, I could be very wrong. I could be very wrong with everything I just said. Like I said, uh, I really don't have, I mean, the guy, the guy who I spoke to at the time, you know, told me that this was Harpies in the Night. I believed it was Harpies in the Night. I still think it's Harpies in the Night. Um, I'm almost positive Glenn says harpies in the night, like, uh, in the chorus, but what the fuck do I know? Um, to reiterate what I said last week, I think this is important to note. I, I am not an expert, man. I'm not. I am just a fucking fan. That's it. I'm a fan and I'm a filmmaker and I'm trying to make uh, a documentary about a topic that I fucking love. Go back to the previous episode to hear me talk more about that. Just want to say that. Uh, I've been told elsewhere this is in fact not Harpies in the Night, but rather something else. Uh, so maybe the song uh, was dr called Drive Me at one point. If the third Cough Cool session track, again, refer to my previous uh, uh, broadcast from last week. If the third Cough Cool session track was indeed Harpies, and if you're going to listen to it, listen to it on YouTube, please. Because that just helps me. Help me by listening to it on YouTube. It's on my channel. Um, if that third Cough Cool session track was indeed Harpies, is it possible that Glenn wanted the crowd to know that the song used to be called Drive Me and had a name change. By that point in October, they would have already recorded Harpies over the summer. Could this uh, explain why the guy I had interviewed had sung Sing Like Harpies in the... Wait, what? I don't know why I wrote that. Sing Harpies in the Night. Who knows? Whatever. Um, I swear the part about Scream Like Harpies in the Night was also on Misfit Central. Ian, it's possible. I don't think it is. Uh, I would love for you to actually look that up and let me know right now. Um, maybe you're right. I'm pretty sure the only thing is I'm going to throw away the key to the feline nursery. And if somebody does say scream like harpies in the night or sing like harpies in the night, it's somebody else who's heard what I've heard and has a better inkling than I do on it. Um, it may be, maybe it's under a comment thread in this. I would link it, man. Link it. Ian, go find go find it and link it in these comments because I'd like to read for myself. I'm learning shit too. I want to know. Um, point is, is that is it possible that the song did used to be called, before it was Harpies in the Night, maybe it was called Drive Me, and they changed the name to Harpies in the Night in the same way that Feline Nursery turned into Spinal Remains. And he's letting the crowd of, you know, five people or whoever's in the audience, you know, probably like nobody, but to Glenn is everybody because it's his audience when they're just beginning as a band. He wants to let everybody know that it's the song is, uh, used to be called Drive Me. This used to be Drive Me. That, I don't know, it, it could, it does, it could make sense. Who knows? Um, could this explain why, I don't know why I wrote that, that next part, that makes no sense. Uh, but, oh, 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 I see why I wrote that. So if this, in fact, is not Harpies in the Night, if this song is not Harpies in the Night, and this song is, uh, in fact, a song called Drive Me, another lost song called Drive Me, 
then um, perhaps that's why um, the, the the other guy saying sing like harpies in the night, and that turns out to be the truth. Like that is in fact that that both people are valid because if this is harpies in the night, then it makes what that dude who I interviewed it, it makes everything he said invalid because that mean because this song does not go sing like harpies in the night or as Ian says scream like harpies in the night in the night and perhaps. There's another recording out there where they say it, where it's a lot easier to hear scream like harpies in the night, in the night. Although, as I'm going to get into with this song, it sounds like he's saying harpies in the night. That's what I heard. I don't know, man. Maybe I just desperately want to hear. You know, when you want to hear lyrics a certain way, you hear them a certain way. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm making a meal out of very, very little information when you really think about it. Um, the song starts with a plodding two note bass line. Dum 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 dum. I wrote dum dum dum, but it's like dum 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 dum. And that on the tape is when uh, where the song starts to kick in. And 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 Manny said to me while we were listening, uh, and he said it very proudly. He was like, "Oh, you've never heard this song," uh, and he had every right to be proud because you know if it wasn't for him. This long, this lost song only exists because of him, you know. At least as we know it currently, you know. Uh, you found the quote. Great, Ian. Post the quote right now. Let's see. It. Let's see it, man. I'm, I'm dying. I'm dying to see this myself. Um, that will color everything else that I'm about to say right now. So post that shit. Um, post the whole link if you can uh, to the thread. I'm assuming it's in the the forum. If not, I don't think it's in the timeline. Um so the song starts off with the plotting two note bass line. Doom dum 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 uh oh right, right. This is a lost song. Oh this song this lost song only exists because of Manny, at least as we know. And then uh I go off on a tangent here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go off on this tangent because it's pretty interesting, real quick. Um who knows what else Glenn has been sitting on, right? He seems to paradoxically uh, both value and devalue stuff like this. Um, I've heard rumors that, you know, Glenn, a lot of Glenn's misfit stuff is kind of in disarray. What he has left of it. I don't know. I, I again, all here say, I don't really fucking know. I don't know. I don't know. Anybody who's listening, I don't know. Um, that it, everything's kind of in disarray and it would kind of like make sense with the, with the thought process of like, you know, um, when Glenn turned over the Caroline tapes and they wanted everything, you know, that was part of the deal as they were negotiating. And this is public knowledge. So Caroline paid, paid, uh, for the settlement, uh, with, with Glenn, with Jerry and the rest of the players. Like Glenn was in the middle of the deal with, with the middle of this big deal with Caroline. And part of that deal was that, uh, I believe was that Caroline would pay the the uh, to settle with the other band members so they could you know bring this shit out? Here we go. Whoa, Ian, you're blowing my mind. It's been a long time since I read that that timeline. The song was performed at some of the early Misfit shows in 1977 before Fra Franche Coma joined the band. The chorus lyric was, "We scream like harpies in the night. We scream like harpies in the night." in the night sing like harpies in the night in the night we scream like someone should just make that song anyway like musicians out there like someone write write that just write put that in your fucking reconstitute that song um very cool ian thank you for um thank you for finding that that is great um right okay moving on as I was talking about, uh, right. So, so I mentioned last week how Glenn, you know, turned over the, the tapes and the tapes were in shitty condition, not necessarily because of Glenn's fault. Uh, although who knows what, what, what got deteriorated as a result of however Glenn chose to stash his, his tapes. Maybe they were in an attic. Maybe they were sitting in a cardboard box in the basement of his, of his parents' house where he used to live. You know, who knows what the condition of all this stuff was, but he, you know, he turned over uh, all this material to Caroline, and as I said, Caroline essentially saved all of the Misfits catalog by digitizing it as it was disintegrating. It's running through this tape head, and it's freaking disintegrating. It's crazy, crazy what's happening. Uh, go back to last week's live broadcast to hear that whole story. 
Um, so when Glenn's collecting all the material and he's searching for the cough cool and he can't find it, um, what else did Glenn have? Like, what else was what else was what else was Glenn sitting on? You know, think that Glenn was kind of like. I mean, from what people tell me about Glenn, he had a basement full of shit. We've seen pictures of his basement, tons of action figures. He just had a basement full of cool shit. He had comic books stacked to the ceiling. He had um, books. He had you know uh, VHS tapes. He just had all this sort of stuff. Probably had tons of home recordings of of stuff that he had made, uh, song experiments, stuff that he probably thought was not commercially applicable to Caroline, who's trying to put out Misfit stuff. Caroline's trying to make something that would eventually become the Static Age album and the box set, right? And so, you know, they're sort of like picking what is what, and I can tell you, maybe I should save that for another day. I can tell you that I have personally heard at through the graciousness of a man that will remain nameless, but a fucking cool fucking guy. I have heard alternate takes to a lot of songs from those sessions. That's right, motherfuckers. You want to hear some kind of hate, but with a more Elvisy vocal? Because it motherfucking exists. Um, it's pretty fucking cool. Um, there's a reason why uh, Teenagers from Mars and Children in Heat begin and end the way they do um, because they're supposed to full fuse into each other. They're supposed to, uh, naturally, when they're being played live, go from one into the other one. That's how they worked it out live. All this stuff that I discovered. So, point being is that when I listen to alternate takes of Children in Heat and Some Kind of Hate and stuff like that, it made me realize there is so much more shit that we just don't know about. As I said last week, we think we know everything. We don't. There's so much shit. There's these Manny tapes. There's, there's so much going on. So who knows what else Glenn had recorded, you know, um, uh, he felt some of his other, perhaps, again, speculation here, not saying I know the answer, perhaps he felt that some of his other material wasn't needed or unnecessary or not up to snuff, like the studio masters that were being presented, that would eventually be presented in the box set. Um, some, and this is, this is a more generalized statement, right? Sometimes... People don't see, and by people I mean artists, people don't see the complete value of something because they are looking at one quality instead of another. A great example, um, us fans. Jerry talked about how he wanted to put an alternate take of Bullet on the box set. Yeah, man, I'm telling you, there is a lot of extra shit. Look at the outtakes, that outtakes track, Ian, on on the, the last bonus track on... Uh, the Static Age, um, on the Static Age record, there's like all these in little snippets of just, there's tons of shit that we have not heard. Um, tons of really cool shit. And uh, so anyway, uh, artists, I think artists, musicians, uh, artists, filmmakers, some they don't see the complete value of something because they're looking at one quality instead of the other. Perhaps they're looking at aesthetic quality. Uh, oh, I recorded this song on my phone, and it's really tinny, and it's not how I want to be represented. I'd much rather someone only hear the studio recording, but I'm going to self-edit myself and not include th this original outro and uh, this original intro to the song. So it gets lost to time, and it only exists on the tinny iPhone recording of whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the mindset of, of artists. Perhaps Glenn has these tapes, or has material, or has songs, or has songs written down, or has... Just, just stuff that he was like, you know, this doesn't really, this doesn't really cut the mustard. I'm not going to send this to Carolina. I, you know, um, musicians want themselves to be represented in a certain way, as uh, any artist really. And artists have a way of self-censoring or editing themselves so that they can appear how they want to be perceived to the public. Even if Glenn was kind of over the misfits and fully into Sam Aim and then eventually Danzig, he still probably put enough. He still put enough thought and care uh, to make sure these things were released. You know, the box set, even though the box set, you know, did not, th those releases did not come out. He would later say, oh, that's not how I wanted it to be at all. You know, he had a lot of gripes about that, but he still wanted them to come out. He still wanted there to be a Misfits box set, whether it was for m money or not. And, and it still had to, you know, look a certain way, you know, uh, Glenn has always said, and the truth, and here's, here's a great, okay, here, wow, this just came to me. Here's a great example of this that we've seen in later in Glenn's career. Glenn in 2007 drops the lost tracks of Danzig, 
They recorded four different versions of When Death Had No Name. They recorded Trouble endlessly. They would keep recording songs and they were never, it was never perfect enough. And so they would put these things on the shelf and they had so much extra material that they released a double album of it. And so it's like, man, you know, if that, you know, if that's Glenn's, and that, that lines up with what Bobby Steele told me about, you know, Glenn pulling shit out of the trunk and, and, and picking out one or two really good songs and then bringing them to practice to flesh out, you know? So Glenn likes to take the cream of the crop. And so perhaps there's so much shit. And that's what like a song, like maybe drive me into harpies in the night or just drive me or, or harpies in the night or whatever the fuck it is. You know, that's what that is. That's where it exists. That's where it lives. And perhaps he just still has a box of that stuff. You know, just just collecting dust. You know, if Manny has this, and then who knows what Jerry has? Think about all the runoff tapes. Jerry probably has like just lying. Jerry probably has it like holding up a computer, like it's like a coaster or something. And he's like, oh, oh yeah, you know, like you know, Jerry's like, oh hey, look at this. Oh, it's cool. Hey, hey, here, kid, have this. You know, just like to make somebody like fucking happy. Because Jerry's the kind of guy that's like wants to make people happy. He's like, oh here, hey, kid, have my bass. I was at that New York show. You know, everybody who was at the New York show saw the legendary moment I shot it on on my cell phone when the girl who's in a wheelchair is is fucking crowd surfing towards Jerry and Jerry is in awe. And Glenn's like, well, look at fucking this over here. And Jerry just hands, <laughs> takes the bass, the perfectly working bass off of his shoulder. It's like, I want you to have my bass. And as it turns out, that girl happened to be a bass player, which is like perfect. Like what a perfect end to that story. A bass player gets a bass from Jerry only because she's fucking circle pitting and crowd surfing in, 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 in the mosh pit. So my point to all of this is, is that who knows what is really out there. Perhaps that uh, both scream like harpies in the night or sing like harpies in the night is just as valid as what I'm about to tell you right now that I heard on this tape, Drive Me. Um, Sometimes releases uh, still would not come out the way he would want them. That box set at that time uh, was an incredible treasure trove to rabid fiends of the day, period. Back to the song Harpies in the Night, Drive Me, Scream Like Harpies in the Night, whatever the fuck I'm hearing. Um, overall, it is once again pure doors. This song is pure fucking doors. Either that's how Glenn wanted to present them at the time, or much like the Ramones trying to write Beach Boy songs, or as Paris Mayhew once uh, told me at his loft, uh, the Cro-Mags were just trying to play like Motorhead. You try something out with inspiration in mind, right? And this is, goes back to being just a musician in general. You're influenced by something. The Ramones were influenced heavily by the Beach Boys. They're influenced by a lot of shit, by the Stooges. The Ramones are heavily influenced by the Beach Boys. So what happens when they try to write a Beach Boys song? What do you think Sheena is a punk rocker is? That's a fucking Beach Boy song. They're trying to do Beach Boys songs, and it's coming out like Sheena is a punk rocker. It goes through one ear, it goes through the computer, and I kind of like, I kind of like think that like it. What happens is it's influenced by your flavor, your ability, and your sensibility, right? Um, it's kind of like a filter plugin on Pro Tools. You put the sound through the filter plugin, and it comes out sounding like something else. Uh, it comes out sounding completely different. So in one ear goes a Beach Boys song for Joey Ramone or for Glenn. In one ear, he's like, oh yeah, the doors. Yeah, whatever, you know? Um, and out comes Harpies in the Night. Out comes Sheena is a punk rocker. And that's like the beauty. Drive like Harpies in the Night? Maybe, Denise, maybe. Maybe it is Drive like Harpies in the Night. Who knows? Um, point is, is that it comes, it comes out, man. It comes out differently, man. It just comes out differently. Uh, I'm losing myself here. Let me let me get back. Uh, recalibrating. Okay. This coffee is fucking caffeinated as fuck. If you want more about that Doors thing, go back and listen to the first broadcast. That seems to be the theme of this episode. Go back and listen to the first broadcast, right? <clears throat> uh, the Doors piano... Uh, well, no. Ooh, yeah. The Doors piano kicks in to take the steering wheel from the bass. So we have the plotting bass line to go back, circling back now. Doom, 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 doom. And then, and then the piano sounds like a Doors song. It sounds like it could be straight off of fucking, like, uh, L.A. Woman or whatever. Just anything. It's like, it's like, um, it's like, dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. 
then yet he bunches up the, the keys like dun 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 something like that. Like he's like he's trying to like create speed with the dun dun dun. So it's like doom 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 dun 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 something like that. Uh and Glenn is okay, and then and then here's this is the part that just Paul Bearer, when I interviewed Paul Bearer from Sheer Terror for this project, hardcore guy, he says that Glenn can just stretch out notes with his voice. And he doesn't do it later on in the hardcore years. Like, blah, 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 blah. You know, or he's like, just like barking shit. But early on, he would stretch those notes. He would croon. As I said last week, his voice is a velvety croon. It's like, it's like uh, soft, but with a rough edge at the same time. And so vo Glenn's voice manages to croon in the form of wailing if that is even possible. It is almost operatic. He's almost like, I don't know what the hell he was saying. He was just going, no, 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 no. But then the keys start to bunch up. Thank you, Ian, for the source too. That's what I wanted. Um, he just the key sponge ups is going no 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 I'm butchering that I'm sorry I am butchering this this is not this is just how I'm hearing it in my head man I don't know I don't know don't judge me for this but then like um then the piano bunches up it's like dun it's like dun 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 because the song Get, speeds up the song speeds up right um it's almost operatic it's everything you would want from a lost Mi misfits track until the piano sets us up for dun 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 and glenn sings this very this i remember so clear i remember it clear as day this is the one of those lyrics i remember it, it's crystal crystal clear for the most part except for one word which i'll talk about a little bit later um so he's going dun 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 and then he goes and this is the thing that I sing to myself more than anything. It's more than I sing harpy sing like harpies in the night. Now I say this is the thing that I like when I'm on the way to work, I hum this when I'm, you know, uh mowing the lawn, because the lawnmower is too loud to play music. So I'm just humming this in my head. Uh, you know, when I'm changing my daughter's diaper. Uh, he goes, it goes, dun, 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 dun. And then the piano kind of, I don't remember what the piano does, but this is the melody for sure. And this is the fucking lyric he sings. He goes, <clears throat> he goes, I'll sh it goes, dun, 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 dun. I'll shake my guts out for you. Like something like that, man. Like just, he's just stretching every note, man. He's stretching every note. And it's either he's saying, I shook my guts out for you. I think he's saying, I took my guts out for you. I took my guts out for you. And I have said that, all, it's like a mantra. I say it over and over. I never want to forget it. And I just say it over and over. He goes, I shook my guts out for... No, I took my guts out. Whatever, shook or took, one of those two. I, I always say shook. It's took. I believe it's took. I took my... Or later in the song that he says took. I don't remember. One of the two. Maybe he says shook and then he says took. But he goes, I took my guts out. But the one thing is for certain, the for you, he goes, for you or for you. Or he's just, he's stretching it. He's just stretching it. And then there's some garbled something. And then he goes... Something in the night, something to night. No, strangers in the night, strangers to night. Or we're just something in the night. We're just strangers in the night. Lovers in the night. Stranger, I shook my guts out for you. We're strangers. Dun, dun, in the night, strangers in the night. 
and meanwhile, um, and then, and then, and then one thing that is very clear, and this is why I think it's Harpies in the Night. This is what made me think it's Harpies in the Night. He, so clearly to me, he said, now you've got his Harpies in, now you've got his Harpies in the night, or Harpies in tonight. And then it goes back to, doom, 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 doom. So he goes, now you've got his Harpies in tonight. Something in the night, I feel like I just watched the movie yesterday. <laughs> I just watched the movie yesterday, the Beatles movie, where the guy, the Beatles disappear, and the guy's like trying to remember how to play all the Beatles songs from scratch. Except he's a musician. So it's like, I shook my gun down for you. And then he goes, and then at the very end, it's like, and now, because it goes into an instrumental break, right? But before it does, he finishes the, the chorus, whatever you want to call it. He goes, now you've got his hoppies in. Now you've got his hoppies in the night. It's either tonight or in the night or something night. It ends with night. You hear a night. But it's not like there's an extra word in there, but that wouldn't make sense. I don't fucking know. I don't fucking know. Um... May, my next part of my notes, <clears throat> now that I've embarrassed the shit out of myself on Facebook Live. Uh, Manny's drums sound like a train chugging along, tight in the pocket. Uh, this is during the instrumental. So it's like Manny's drums the whole time, just like, he's just playing tight in the pocket. Just, it's, it's like, um, wait. Ding, 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 ding. Something like that. And then later on, he says, uh, Now you've got his hobbies in tonight. And then Glenn does this. Glenn does this. And then that's when Manny goes in. That's when Manny starts chugging like a train. Um, Glenn does a, Glenn does like a piano roll, but it sounds like, it sounds like a baby piano. It doesn't sound like, like we've seen the picture of what the piano is, but it just sounds, it just goes, it's just like, so he goes, Something like that. And then the drums are just like... They're just chugging along. They're just... The drums are chugging along. I can't replicate them. It's like... It just feels like a choo-choo train. And be like... I can't... I'm not a drummer, man. Something like that. And then Glenn starts singing over that. And, and he's just going... Uh, um, overall, uh, wait, uh, Glenn does a piano roll. Again, instrumentally, the song is completely based around the piano with a rhythm section to support it. The song uh, is surprisingly full for keys, bass, and drums. Is it a testament to... It is a testament to the power they had even without a guitar. So that is something that I noticed. The sound for for the bass and drums and the keys, it's power. It's still very powerful. It's still very um, full. Uh, it would have been very interesting if he had held on to the piano uh, and they kept the guitar. You know, like, you know, everybody that sort of has played in the Misfits. You know, Bobby was great. Frank, uh, Frank is great. Uh, Doyle is Doyle. Doyle is Doyle. You know, Doyle is a meat and potatoes. You know, uh, rhythm player. Um, you know, I, I, I sort of not, uh, slagged Doyle last week, and I slagged him a little bit just now. I'm going to say this about Doyle positively. Doyle is an incredible rhythm guitar player. Doyle admits that he doesn't, he's not very, he knows his shit, and he knows the misfit shit. Uh, and he figures out stuff that he thinks sounds good in his head. Um, but the one thing that people don't talk, people always talk about how Doyle smashes, punches his guitar and all this stuff, which is very, it's also a very signature sound. You can't deny he has a signature look and a signature sound, whether you like it or not, whether it became very metallic or not. Um, but one thing that is undeniable about Doyle as a player is that he, uh, he has a downstroke hand like Johnny Ramone did. And as anybody who's a guitar player knows, any good guitar player knows, or any guitar player who plays guitar will tell you that even though the Ramones are, you know, it's simple three chord rock, to play like Johnny Ramone, 
playing in only in downstrokes. Instead of, I guess, when you play the guitar, you go you go down all the way instead of like up and down, up and down. You just go straight down. Uh, it's incredibly hard. It's incredibly difficult on the wrist. It's as difficult as when Marky Ramone or Tommy Ramone is doing these eighth notes. You know, that makes your wrist tired. Try it. Try it. Just doing this. This is like what every Ramone song is, right? Like, you get very tired after a while. And so it's like, that's not easy to do. So I'll give that to Doyle. Uh, the point is, it would have been very interesting if Glenn had kept the keyboard, which wouldn't have worked in that hardcore sound that they had later on, how that would have influenced Doyle while playing guitar. How would those two instruments have interacted? Doyle's rudimentary guitar playing with uh, Glenn's uh, piano. And of course, by that stage, Glenn's a front man. He doesn't really want, you know, he doesn't want to look like he's playing the piano, whatever. Um... Talking about, uh, I lost my place in my notes. Ah, like I said, so it sounds surprisingly full for, for these three instruments. It's a testament to their power. And, you know, I think that's pretty freaking cool. You know, like that's a pretty cool thing when you think about it. Um, next. Uh, so the song chorus, I put chorus in question marks, repeats that same thing. I shook my, or I took my guts out for you, repeats. Um, and then maybe it's shook or took instead of shake. I thought it also it might have been shake. Uh, the song ends with Glenn letting us know something along the lines of, now you've got a zombie babe tonight. He's saying, now you got a da 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 I don't know. I don't fucking know. Um, Ian, you are correct, actually. Yes, there is keyboards on Nike A Go Go. Yes, and thank you for reminding me of that because somebody recently reminded me uh, very much about Nike A Go Go. I'm not going to say anything more than that. I'm just going to say that Nike A Go Go, very interesting song with uh, that that does have keys. I guess I I don't know uh, or or did have keys at one time. Uh, I don't know. I don't know, Ian. Ian, I have no comment on that currently. Uh, I I'll have may have a comment on that in the future, but right now, I have no comment on that. Okay, somebody else like this. Steve Wig, you agree with Ian, so I guess there is a piano. I guess I need to listen again to Nike. Um, although apparently there were maybe, I don't know, whatever. In any case, uh, <clears throat> so... What the fuck was I talking about? So yeah, so it ends with like, something along with, now you've got a zombie babe. It sounds like he's saying zombie babe tonight or something babe tonight. But early on, it sounds like he's saying, now you've got harpies in, now you've got harpies in, now you've got harpies in the night. Something like that. Um, but that kind of counteracts the, we scream like harps in the night or sing like harps in the night. Or maybe what my guy meant to say was scream my copies in the night. In any case, either way, e e yes, there's multiple mixes. One bootleg has a tinny sounding keyboard intro. Really, Ian? Ian, my man Ian is the MVP here today. With just like all, Ian, can you post a link to that? I would love to hear that shit. Please post the, uh, post the, the one with the tinny sounding keyboard uh, intro. Oh the dun 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 um, okay. Moving on. Uh, actually, that's really it. I, I think I'm, I think I'm all spent, guys. I'm trying. I mean, it was just, it's just amazing. It was amazing to hear this. It was amazing to hear this, this song. Um, it's by far, I think it's by far my favorite one that I got to hear from, from this stuff. Here's one thing I will talk about. So remember how I said, and maybe this will be after, you know, there are two more tracks that I really want to explore in depth. And then we'll do a general overview of the rest of the set from songs that everybody knows, with just like little notes here or there. Uh, 
And then there's some other material that um, I have come across. Now, I wouldn't call it material. I just say I have come across some discoveries in my travels, in my research. I came across them years ago. I, I've, I've had, I've, I've, it's, there's some interesting stuff out there. And uh, if you can find it, I've mentioned it on Facebook before. You can file, search for it, uh, search for comments that I've had in, I don't know, whatever. In any case, um, yeah, maybe we'll discuss more of that uh, in the future. But let's, uh, all right, let's try something new. Let's try something new. Uh, let's open it up here. Does anybody have any comments, want to want to talk, say anything, contribute something else that they want to uh, uh, mention about this, that, or the other uh, in regards to this stuff? I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm kind of spent. <laughs> Like, I don't want to stop talking, but I'm kind of spent. I'm trying to think of something else that I could talk about. I don't want to, like, you know, go through every single thing. It's, it's fun to, like, do it in increments, you know, like, save something for next Sunday and the Sunday after that. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. What do you guys think? Um, let me see if I missed anything here. I mean, that's really it. Uh, but yeah, this this blew my mind. I, my mind was blown to hear this stuff. And I just like, I couldn't believe that uh, uh, I was hearing what I was hearing. And just to know that there are more, there are two more. Okay, here's what I will say. There's three more tracks that are of, of note that we, we really, really want to uh, talk about. So that's the recording I'm thinking of, but I can't recall the bootleg that has the keyboard really loud in the mix. Ian, what did you, Ian, what did you post? You didn't post anything. You, oh, you're replying to Ian, but I don't know. These comments are all out of order. Uh, see thread. It says to see the thread. Ah, thank you. All right. Um, I, to keep this clean, I'm actually going to listen to this on headphones <clears throat> so I can hear what you guys are talking about. And I'll have a comment for you in one second. Hold on. Let's take a look. Let's take a let's take a gander. Let's take a listen. Cause I have not now, but I have some. We'll talk. Oh yeah, yeah. I hear it. I hear the tin. Oh, that's very common. I mean, not very common, but I've heard it. Yeah, it's a lot. You know what it sounds like? It sounds, yeah, Sessions version. That's what this is. It sounds like something off of, it's, it's from the box set. It's from the box set. I mean, yeah, that's cool. You know, it's great. Um, hey, bud. So did you ever find these songs in the live YouTube videos from the 70s or bootlegs? No, none of this stuff is. Uh, Adriano, none of this stuff is on YouTube. None of it. Um... Sorry, just jumped in looking forward to everyone. Thanks for doing this. Fun stuff. Thank you, Steve, for tuning in. Um, yeah, Adriano, none of this stuff is on. Harpies or West End is not on YouTube, and you're not going to find it on YouTube. Um, and if it ever came up on YouTube, that would be a real, I think that would be really sad because I'd really like to see an official release of that stuff. And if that stuff gets out on YouTube, it might never, ever be released. And um, I think the people that made those recordings deserve to get paid. Um, you know, see some some coin from that stuff. Um, Ian, to reply... Okay, Ian and Stephen. Stephen, I don't know if you left. Is this you just say, I jumped in, I looked forward to rewatch? Oh, oh, I just didn't jumped in and looked forward to rewatching. Ah, gotcha. Um, so Stephen and Ian, here's something for you. Um, I'm sure you've heard... This is... Uh, Adriano, this is very common. One of, in my opinion, one of the rarest discoveries, one of the most recent rarest discoveries is actually about 13 years old now that, that you can easily get on, on YouTube. Look for the Plan 9 version of Devil's Warehouse. Does anybody listen to that? It is unfriggin' believable. So before Ruby Records, Ruby Slash Records put out Walk Among Us, there was the Plan 9 version of Walk Among Us, which is the first version of Walk Among Us and those sessions were called from 12 Hits from Hell. Some of them, some of the songs were remixed. Some of the songs had the guitar taken off because uh, those songs shared guitar with Bobby, Doyle, and Glenn. Uh, the, the 12 Hits stuff. Um, the Devil's Whorehouse, however, has 
some weird shit going on. The Plan 9 version. Maybe someone knows what that instrumentation is. Uh, you know what? I'm going to look it up right now. Let's see if we can find the Devil's Horror House uh, Plan 9 version. So when I was in high school, you know, everybody has their... Here we go. They call it a Walk Among Us demo. It's not Revelation Unorthodox. I don't know what that means. All right. Walk Among Us demo. What does it say? Rare bootlegs of the misfits. Walk Among Us demo plan nine. So some people call it the, the demo. As far as I know, that is not a demo. Yeah, I think I have a bootleg record of the plan nine Walk Among Us. Yeah, Adriano, it's pretty It's pretty wide. It, it came out about 13 years ago. That was a big... That was a big to do on Misfit Central Forum. By the way, the moderator, I was the the admin I was talking about uh, that began with a K with the with the clown vomiting a rainbow is Kyle. Kyle is that guy's name, and he was one of the mods on there. And he Kyle uh, turned me on to Nobody. And if you don't know Nobody, check him the fuck out because he is awesome. Everybody, go out and listen to Nobody. I'm posting him in the comments because he is the shit. Um. So yeah, so long before it came out, this is Nobunny, people. Check out Nobunny. I first discovered Nobunny on Misfit Central uh, Forum, and he's become one of my favorite artists. Um, I love this guy. Just check him out. Um, and he's in this documentary, actually. He's been interviewed for this documentary. Uh, so, so yeah, so the Plan 9 Walk Among Us, that like leaked. I don't know how that leaked, but somebody like figured out that those sessions were different. The second half is is something is was unheard up to that point. And this was probably around 2006, 2007. And all the things are kind of like whatever. There's one track that is just noticeable, like so unbelievably different. And it's Devil's Whorehouse. Devil's Whorehouse has this weird sort of clacker, I guess. It's like a clacking. It's like a I don't know. And and it's I'm gonna listen to it right now so I can hear what it is I'm trying to say. Uh, let's see if this is the version. Oh, you know what? It might be wise to plug in the headphones before you try and listen to the track. Let's see. Yeah, this is it. Ka! The human pedal so, all right, so here's what's funny about, okay, here's what's really, really funny about the Devil's Whorehouse from the Plan 9, uh, Plan 9 version of Walk Among Us. First of all, Glenn has double tracked his vocals, but they're slightly delayed. So what it sounds like, so what musicians do when they're layering their mo their vocals, um, when you're not uh, double tracking, I guess is what they call it, uh, or what's the one where you can, uh, musicians out there, what's the one that you can do automatically? Uh, it's like, an, it's basically what John Lennon essentially accidentally invented it because he was tired of, 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 of double tracking his own vocals. So he's like, is there a way you can take the same take that I just did and delay it like a microsecond? So that way it sounds like two of me are singing and that invented whatever it's called double tracking. But as you can hear uh, on, on devil's whorehouse on the, uh, boy, this is nerdy as fuck, uh, on, uh, pl the plan nine version you hear him completely singing. Uh, he's singing real loose with both versions. But he, and he's also sort of like doing the, it's almost like Glenn Danzig doing an impression of Danzig, Glenn Danzig. So it's 1981 or 82 Glenn Danzig doing his impersonation of his future self in Danzig, but singing for Walk Among Us. And it's like, she like that's just how he sounds he's, he's like barely like vocalizing and as glenn loves to do when he's singing is he sort of lets the last few syllables of the word like he doesn't finish them she worked that devil go ah like he just like doesn't finish house it's like instead of house he's saying ah ah something like that um but the the uh in, in, he's not tracking them tightly He's tracking the vocals very loose, so it sounds like two Glens singing at the same time. And then there's this weird clacker. It's like a, like a whip, like a, but it's not a whip. It sounds like a wooden block or something. Help me out, people. What the fuck is that? What is that instrumentation that I'm hearing? It's so bizarre. It's like. Whack. It's like this weird cool. Oh, I love to the devil's house. I don't know, man. It's really fucking funny, though. And um, that was like 
a super rare track uh, last de uh, two, almost two decades now uh, ago. Uh, nobody, just the way in the 90s. So in the 90s, it was like in the doorway. Everybody was like, whoa, and a clapper. What's a clapper? Like a, oh, like on a keyboard, he's just doing a clap noise, like a, like a, like a program sound or something. I don't know. Uh, something, so, something or else, something or else. Uh, so that was pretty rare. Um, and then in, in 2011, I discovered, uh, some live misfits, uh, audio video, uh, footage of them at Max's Kansas city, uh, covering the doors. Um, and it was before Bobby joined the band and it was right after Frank left the band. It's pretty fucking cool. We'll talk about that. After we finish this live show, we'll talk about that if we get there. Or a canasta, what they use in flamenco, maybe. Adriano, you might be right. I don't know, man. I, I would love for someone to track down that noise. I always thought it was really funny, like a really cool, funny sound thing. Whatever. And, um, yeah, it's great. It's great. I don't know. Anything, anybody got anything else? I'm like, I'm, 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 I want to keep this going, but like, I'm, I think it's like, I think it's run its course. I think it's over. Does anybody have any... All right, does anybody have any comments or questions or want to like, you know, um, anything that they're wondering? Not like, not to ask me necessarily, just like in general, like what do you, you know, something that interests you, you know, um, I feel like misheard lyrics is such like a, a cliche. We've all talked about that uh, for forever and ever. I'll tell you one thing that I found interesting, really, um, in one of the Facebook groups, uh, I learned that I guess, so I guess um, some of those Earth AD, the rare colors of Earth AD, um, over time, the colors change. So a yellow turns into an orange, and apparently that's like really nice. Sean, have I ever seen any footage from the 79 Halloween show? Okay, so I'm not sure if there is any footage from the 79 Halloween show. I think... Where did you hear that? Did Bobby, that Bobby said that there was uh, footage? Like, like, what would it be? Umatic tape? My God, that would love to see that. I would love to see footage because we've seen pictures of the 79 show. I'd love to see footage to go with that. That's like, I don't know if that's the first time that Glenn has donned, you know, corpse paint, grease paint, face paint. But I mean, there's the, there's the first time any fucking horror punk paints his face with a skeleton, right? Like, I'm, who else does that? In a non, like, um, screaming... And you know who opened for them? No, that was next year when Doyle first joined the band. You know, and that's how they eventually got the inspiration. Oh, here we go. That's how they eventually got the inspiration to sort of jump out of coffins. Maybe it was before... No, it wasn't that show, but they had, they were inspired by Screaming Jay Hawkins, who used to come out of, out of coffins. And, you know, there was like some nasty, like, you know, talk, criticism of Bobby, because Bobby couldn't punk, push his way out of his coffin. They would jump out of coffins. That's why they have coffin-shaped doors um, at the entrances. And Glenn has talked about interviews since, but they used to run trailers. 